Muted. Start. Good morning, everyone. The webinar will start in uh, just one minute. Thank you. Good morning. This is Ed Shore. I'm Senior Vice President at the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. And I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, today's webinar on care planning for children with special health care needs. This is the third in our series of webinars on care coordination. I want to thank the Catalyst Center at Boston University and Family Voices for helping co-sponsor uh, this webinar today. Our uh, moderator is uh, Jean McAllister, who's an associate research professor of pediatrics at Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, Jean has a long time uh, history leading uh, healthcare improvement, particularly around medical homes. Uh, she is the author of today's recommended reading, uh, Achieving a Shared Care of Plan, Care Plan for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs, uh, which uh, you can see a link to on your website, on your web uh, page, and it's also on the Lucille Packard website. Uh, she also co-authored with uh, Richard Antonelli and Jill Pop uh, uh, an important article called Making Care Coordination a Critical Component of the Pediatric Health System, uh, which can be found on the website of the Commonwealth Fund. Jean? Greetings. Thank you for the opportunity to join some great panelists and talk about one of my favorite subjects care coordination and how planned coordinated care and shared plans of care are a great approach to family-centered care coordination. This has been so critical over time consistently to children and youth, to families, to professionals, and indeed across our systems as we look for effective and efficient methods to, um, to use. For families, they're constantly asking for help over time, coordinating and communicating across multiple complex systems. Providers that I have worked with struggling to achieve evidence-based care for children and families that they serve and help them to achieve recommended treatments and interventions in the face of the fragmented systems. And regarding those fragmented systems, we have such marvelous people in our system with such tremendous skill and yet communication coordination challenges and fragmented systems make it very difficult and we often get less than the sum of the parts instead of more. Personally, I've been working in this field <coughs> really since the late 70s, but it was 1993 where our work focused on medical home in 1997 where the Maternal and Child uh, Health Bureau first funded medical home grants. Fifteen years after that, we studied some best practices, primary care practices, and found that, not surprising, it was family-centered care, teamwork, care coordination, shared plans of care, and quality improvement 
that were making them uh, really notable best practices. Now today we have some incentives for care coordination, but we continue to have some confusion about care coordination meaning, but this is getting better. We have closer definitions, we have frameworks, we have a standard of care, we have, a, we have system standards of care, and as we talk about today, we have a model approach. Still, there is a lot to learn, and we need lots of good examples of care planning and the use of shared plan of, plans of care achieved in partnership with families. A, a few days ago, as, as I typically do in an improvement mindset, I used the comment, you know, we, we, these are baby steps, we're taking baby steps, and one of our care coordinators responded, when is this baby going to grow up? And I thought that was such a great comment. And actually, I think we have some good news. I think we have bigger than baby steps to share with you today. We have um, a lot of examples of the application of shared plans of care, of strong coordination, um, and, and we have them here in Indiana. We're going to talk about them in Vermont and Pennsylvania. And I am certain we'll hear from some of you that we will have some examples where you are. We have some really terrific standout speakers for you today, which I'll introduce in just a minute. But first, I want to just talk about the function of the webinar. Like many, you're able to enter questions on the GoToWebinar chat box. If you want to target them to a particular speaker, please do so, but I think it will be wonderful to hear from both in terms of their perspectives. For the enjoyment of all, we'll be muted for the duration of the web webinar to reduce distraction. But we will have recording and slides posted on the Foundation's website, and that will be shared with all of you. Next up, there will be a poll question that the Foundation would love you to answer. We won't be posting results, but they will definitely be using them. So if you could take a moment to uh, answer this poll question, and then we will get ahead with introduction of speakers. So I'm going to go ahead, as that is being uh, dealt with, and the next slide pops up, to, to just introduce our speakers to you. I think it's terrific that we have Jill Reinhardt, who I've worked with for over 20 years on medical home and care coordination, representing primary care. Jill is a partner at Hagen Reinhardt and Connolly Pediatricians in Burlington, Vermont my alma mater at UVM. She's a clinical associate professor there, um, a professor of pediatrics, and this is at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. Before we hear from Jill, we're going to hear from a children's hospital and specialty program paradigm, and that will be Anique Hogan, who I've met virtually and look forward to meeting personally. She's the medical director of the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania's Compass Care Program as well as their integrated care service. And this, of course, is in Philadelphia. So I would like to turn it over to Anique, and she will tell you a bit about the Compass Care Program. Thank you, Jeannie. It's a pleasure to be here today to discuss this important topic with you. As you all know, this population of medically complex patients is a growing one. And with that growth, it is going to become increasingly more important for us to get this right and to develop these care plans that will meet the needs of our patients and their families. Next slide. I would like to begin by framing our conversation. So as Jeannie mentioned, I'm a pediatrician here at CHOP, and my program is known as Compass Care. 
we are a consulting complex care program and we are based out of the main campus of our institution. As such, we are considered a tertiary care care coordination program. So we work directly in partnership with primary care and specialty care providers, um, as well as our families, to develop these care plans and to coordinate care for our medically complex patients. So our population of patients um, are, are quite complex. They have multiple uh, complex chronic conditions, multiple specialists involved, and they spend a great deal of time in and out of the hospital or the emergency department. As a result of that, our program has both an ambulatory component and an inpatient component so that we can follow our patients across the spectrum of care and really try to link together all the different members of the care team around the care of this patient and their family. This team is a multidisciplinary team, as you can see there, and that is really essential to the functioning of this team to have all team members on board. Next slide. So I want to begin with talking about the goals of the care plan as, as we think about them. So first and foremost, we are looking to articulate and communicate our patient and family concerns as well as their goals. This really is a starting place uh, for us in these, in these care plans so that we can bring these concerns and goals to the rest of the care team, especially for some of those families who may not feel as comfortable articulating those uh, themselves. We're also looking to provide a concise medical summary for each of these patients to really take that inventory of all the issues and challenges that this patient may have and then to communicate uh, from those problem-based plans for each, of those, for each of those issues. We're also looking to provide contingency plans. So this is planning for in case of emergency, but also contingency planning for anticipated events and transitions of care as well. And then finally, our care plan needs to clarify who is on the care team and what are the roles of each member of that care team in our patient's care. Next slide. So when we think about creating care plans, it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed by all the details. And pretty soon you find yourself drowning in sticky notes and reminders and all these FYI messages. Um, but, uh, next slide. I would like to instead offer up this approach. I often liken care coordination and care planning to sort of this professional organization uh, within medicine. So we are taking a large amount of information and we are putting it together into a usable resource that can help to guide the path forward with our families. So the electronic health record or EHR is a tool that we can use to help to create and organize the care plan, but it is only that. It is a tool. It will help you to generate and share the care plan, but it really won't replace the need for the manpower and the expertise required to put all the right pieces in place. Next slide, please. So when we think about our care plan, it's always important to remember who is the target audience for this, for this care plan. First and foremost, that is our patients and their families. So we develop this in partnership with them, and they are our initial target audience for them. So we want this this document um, or snapshot to provide that overview of all these um, issues and challenges this patient may have and really what is going on with that patient. For some patients and families, seeing the big picture may come fairly easily, but for others it may be a real challenge to be able to find that big picture amidst all the day-to-day -day details. And that's where the care plan can really serve a vital function. Our additional target audience is, of course, the care team, and this is really every member of the care team. It's very easy, as Jeannie mentioned, for people to get siloed within their own area, and having a comprehensive care plan allows each member of the care team to see where they fit into the whole and to really get a better understanding of the entire scope of challenges that this patient and family may be facing. So there are other healthcare providers, um, often it's determined by the patient and family. So when patients are admitted to the hospital, when they're in the emergency room in urgent care, if they're within our healthcare system um, here at CHOP, we are all on one electronic health record, they can all view the care plan. But we encourage our patients and families to bring the care plan to be shared with their other, with their other providers. And those may be other healthcare providers, but other home and school providers as well. And we'll get to that when we think about how we share the care plan with them. Next slide. So 
With the development of the care plan, it's important to note that there is a good deal of work that can and should be done prior to the visit. So I'll preface this by saying that we do develop our care plans as part of a face-to-face -face visit with our families. because We really think that it's important to demonstrate that partnership in reality, in the concrete nature of those, of those encounters. But for that visit, our care coordinators um, do a pretty extensive chart review where they go through and with our EHR they can create an abstract encounter, but it gives them the chance to be able to look over the problem list, see how comprehensive or complete it may or may not be, to look through all the previous specialty and primary care visits, hospitalizations, ER visits, so you can get a real sense of what has been happening with this patient and begin to create that framework from which the care plan is going to be constructed. Um, it also gives a chance to look at any upcoming events um, that, may, that may be occurring. So whether that be planned admissions, planned procedures, um, uh, testing or studies, whatever that may be. It's a chance to look through the care team and get a sense before even that visit of who is on the care team. Next slide. So, when developing the actual care plan itself, um, we always start with the patient family concerns and their goals. We want to allow the patients and their families to ar the chance to articulate these concerns and goals so that we can work with them to prioritize issues within the care plan. This really helps us to get on the same page with our patients and families. By understanding what's important to the family and developing an appreciation of what the family understands about their patient's condition, we can help to ensure that the care plan that we mutually develop is going to allow them to meet their needs for their child's care. It also gives us the chance to be able to see where they're coming from so we can bring our concerns forward as well and really find a way to meet around those common goals. Next slide. So an integral part of developing the care plan is determining the members of the care team. It's not enough to know which specialties are involved, but you need to know which people um, are on the team within a given specialty that are working with that patient. Furthermore, it's important to clarify the role of each team member. Oftentimes, there may be problems for which it is not clear who is taking the lead role. So for example, if a patient has a gastrostomy tube for feeding and sees a gastroenterologist, a surgeon, a feeding specialist, and their primary care provider, it may not be clear who's managing the feeding regimen or who's making the decisions about the relevant medications. This can become even more complicated if they also have a pulmonologist or if they have any other multidisciplinary clinics that may have nutrition support associated with them. You have to realize that within the care team, this is not just um, physician providers. This is all the different members of the care team within those different arenas caring for this child. Um, taking the opportunity to sit down and lay out the care team also allows you to identify if there are any missing pieces within the care team. So if there are any issues or problems that don't have a provider taking the lead, or if a patient does not have a problem, uh, does not have a provider within a key specialty area, this is how it's going to come to light when you can sit down and take that inventory. Next slide. So, this brings us to the component of the care plan that focuses on the summary of these active medical issues and problems. It's important to, focus, to emphasize that this needs to be a concise summary. We choose to organize this as in a problem-based manner. So sometimes we will group problems together around a particular organ system um, for the sake of, of having some clarity there, but we have found the problem-based approach is pretty helpful for us. It's important to have consistent documentation and a collaborative approach to this. So by this I mean we agree upon the same way to capture that information and to display it. So for each problem, we are going to designate who are the care team members that are participating in management of that problem, what's the relevant history of that problem that one needs to know if you were going to look at this snapshot version of that patient, what's the current status of that, what are the medications associated with it, and we'll get to the plan for that in just a moment. We choose to use smart phrases in order to keep us capturing and documenting this in the same way. And we also utilize the multidisciplinary team to pull in this information because we are, we are getting this information from elsewhere within the electronic health record from all these different specialty uh, providers um, that are documenting within our same EHR or outside of our EHR from the other um, elements of history that we can glean prior to the visit. Next slide. Additional key information is particularly important and needs to be in the care plan. So 
current feeds, especially for those patients who have feeding tubes, really becomes as important as medications for these patients. So you need to know what is the feeding regimen, how is it being administered, what kind of feeding tube do they have, and who is managing this. It's not only who's managing the feeding regimen, but also who's managing the feeding tube, because those may not necessarily be the same providers. Then the medications, it's a pretty obvious component of the, of the care plan. If you're fortunate enough that your um, inpatient and outpatient providers are all in the same EHR, this part can be a little bit easier, but still can have its challenges. Um, but we do, uh, we spend a significant amount of time on medication reconciliation with each of these visits to make sure we have an accurate and complete list of medications with the right doses, but also the right route of administration. So for our patients, again, who have significant feeding difficulties, who have aspiration risk, who may have a GJ tube and not just a G tube, we want to make it clear how these medications are being administered. And finally, the home care um, information. So this includes the DME equipment, who those uh, vendors may be, the home nursing information, how many hours of nursing they have, who's the home nursing provider, who are the contact people for each of these arenas, therapies that they have, school information. And again, this is information that is important to have in the, in the care plan but this is information that is gathered by the multidisciplinary team so we can collaboratively develop that plan. Next slide. This then brings us to the development of the plan within the care plan. So this plan, as I've mentioned many times now, is a collaborative plan. So we are pulling together the information from all the different members of the care team, whether they be uh, the different specialists, the primary care provider, um, whether they be within our institution or outside, um, into one place. So it's this one-stop shopping approach. Now, it's not just a matter of copy and paste, however, because some of those uh, plans may not necessarily be compatible with one another. So it's probably not surprising to you to hear that sometimes a specialty plan from one area does not agree with a specialty plan from another, and so we then work with the patient family, with those other care team members, to reach an agreement. So we have one comprehensive plan, and we broker those conversations um, with, the, with the, the providers and with the family. So again, this plan is problem-based, and we have the plan by problem, but we also then have the overarching plans. We think about upcoming planned events, and we make sure that we have the right pieces in place to anticipate when this patient is going to be admitted, what things need to happen, where do they usually go, what studies are they going to need, are there any labs that need to be done while they're going to be there, so on and so forth. The contingency planning is part of this. So this is planning in case of an emergency so that patient families know who to call when they have a problem, um, but also community planning around um, anticipated events as well, whether that be transitions or the upcoming planned events that we talked about. Communication planning is a big part of this. So we ask um, proactive questions to our families about how would they best like us to communicate with them. So sometimes the families will tell us that they, ha they, they like a phone call, they want to use our patient portal for electronic communication, uh, whatever that may be, but then we ask them for their preferences within that so that we can help to meet their needs um, as best as possible. We ask some proactive um, uh, questions about scheduling as well, so that our scheduler who's going to be working with our families will have an idea when she's trying to work with them on this um, schedule of all of their specialty appointments, what are that family's needs? Some families can only really get to get to um, the campus for appointments after a certain time. They have to leave by a certain time each day. Maybe there are certain days of the week they just can't do. Maybe they um, really need to have their appointments consolidated as many as possible into one or two days, as opposed to some families saying, I just can't do more than one or two appointments per day. It's too hard on our family. So we ask that information ahead of time so we can share that with everybody else on the team. And finally, this plan is shared and refined. This is not a one and done phenomenon. We developed this plan with the anticipation it's going to be a living document that's going to be revised over time. Next slide. So when documenting the care plan, as I mentioned, we do this as part of an encounter. And so this gives us a chance to have that face-to-face -face visit, and then we can directly take that information and put it right into a letter. That letter is something that we can then share with the family, and I'll go through that in just a moment. But 
we don't want the documentation to get buried within that encounter. We want to be able to lift it out of the encounter to areas of the EHR that are visible to all users, and they can transcend any one individual unique visit. So within our electronic health record, which happens to be EPIC, we utilize the Longitudinal Plan of Care, sometimes referred to as the LPOC, which is a snapshot view. So we can take these elements of the plan and we can update the important areas within the LPOC so they are visible whether you find our letter within there or whether you look within this place. However, we have found that the letter is still a very important piece of documenting this because it does capture that moment in time. Because other parts of this dynamic LPOC can be changed by many different providers within our healthcare system. And so it's really important for us to know that we can go back to one document that captured it at that moment, knowing that it is dated and it's going to change over time. Next slide. So then we get to how do we share the care plan. So again, we use our electronic health record tools. The LPOC has patient access with it that they can get to through our patient portal. We encourage all of our families to sign up for our patient portal. But we recognize that all, not all families have access to the technology or even the, um, the access to the internet at home that they can utilize to get to this. So this letter is something that is available to all, to the family and to all members of the care team. We send them a hard copy and we release this to the patient portal. So they can look at the LPOC, but they can also look at the letter and they can print it as many times as they want. Next slide. It's not enough to develop the care plan though. It has to be implemented. And doing so involves a great deal of communication between the care team and the patient and family. This may be following up on action items from the care plan or carrying out components of the contingency elements of the plan. It's important to emphasize the role of proactive communication. So one element of this involves scheduled phone calls with the care coordinator at set intervals between our visits. This helps us to identify issues before they become crises. Another example are post-discharge phone calls. After each of our patients are discharged, a member of our team, most often one of our NPs, completes a post-discharge phone call to identify concerns or challenges, and we use a consistent format for these phone calls. As I mentioned, our team functions in both the inpatient and the outpatient setting. This allows us to facilitate communication regardless of the care setting, to bring the big picture care plan into the hospital setting, and to update the care plan based upon the important events or changes from the hospital admission or the ED visit. And finally, in order to generate the care plan and make timely updates, we schedule regular routine follow-up visits. Depending on the level of acuity and how active a patient's medical issues may be, these may be as often as, as every few months, and they're never more than six months apart. Next slide. This is an important thing we can't hide from. This takes time. This, but this is something that can be budgeted for and planned for. So we schedule time specifically focused on developing the care plans. And this is um, scheduled visits when we're not in the midst of a crisis so we can take that step back for that big picture view. If time will not permit for this to happen all in one visit or encounter, then this could be broken up into more than one encounter. And there are also opportunities to be creative about this, to think outside the visit and to utilize the entire care team. As I mentioned, for example, having the nurse coordinators or your social workers work with the families to begin the framework of the care plan prior to the care plan visit. Even after the visit, there will be a lot of work involved in the implementation of the care plan. However, next slide. It's important to remember that care coordination is a team sport. All members of the care team contribute to creating, maintaining, and implementing this care plan. Um, and with that, I will leave little time for questions if you would like, or Jeannie, if you want to prefer to leave them at the end, that is fine too. Hi. Um, we do need to move on to Jill, but I want to address just a couple of things. Yes, the slides and recording will be available, so you do not need to write quickly. You had a question about how about giving families access. You answered it partially. I think we'll loop back to that. I'd like you to just really quickly address whether there's an intrinsic difficulty with basing family goals on the problem list, as families do not like to be considered a list of problems. If you could address that real quickly, we will loop back to that at the end of the hour. 
Absolutely. So in the format of the, of the care plans, we begin before we start going into any of the issues and challenges or problems. The first thing is the patient concerns and, and goals. And sometimes those relate to the, uh, to the medical problems, but not always. And so um, we have found that, 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 is, that having that as our starting place helps them to realize that what is following that is meant to be a medical summary, but not necessarily a picture of that child. Thank you. I think we'll shift over to Dr. Reinhardt now, and then we will have about 10 minutes for questions, which are starting to come in rapidly. So that's marvelous. Uh, Jill, do you want to go ahead? Great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you also for this opportunity to, uh, to present today. It's been uh, the highlight of my day, and you can go ahead and start with that first slide. Um, so this is something I'm, I'm really proud uh, uh, to share with you today and having listened to Dr. Hogan's presentation it's sort of um, a really remarkable uh, gold standard that she provided for us here and uh, bringing this model to the um, if you can go back to the slide before, bringing this model to the everyday pediatrician in the medical home setting. Um, so we start with uh, um, the Pediatric Care Coordination Learning Collaborative in our state has um, been running now for the last couple of years. Um, and what we've been able to do is using those Lucille Packard guidelines on achieving a shared plan of care, help each practice to find a system to uh, implement those, those parts of achieving a shared plan of care um, within the practice. Um, really on the spirit of medical home transformation, but providing um, the actual tools, um, thought processes, and, and strategies for achieving effective care coordination within the primary care medical home. Um, and um, this map is of the different practices within our state that have been involved in um, creating uh, shared plans of care. We have a curriculum, a core curriculum, that we are using to help practices understand care coordination. And it was really inspired because uh, there was uh, funding that been, has been provided to practices along medical home transformation. And people were doing what they called care coordination. And it didn't always mean the same thing um, as what we now know as, of as effective care coordination. Um, one unique part of this uh, opportunity um, is that each practice has on its um, uh, Im implementation team a family health partner or a family advisor or a patient advisor, someone who is a consumer of the practice, knows the practice well, and can provide wonderful feedback to how the process is implemented within that particular medical home. Uh, next slide, please. So my little medical home here in Vermont uh, consists of three pediatricians. We have three pediatric nurse practitioners. We have one main care coordinator, but I would argue, as in many primary care offices, there are um, support people who do various aspects of care coordination. But in terms of the relationship building with families, uh, Christy is our main care coordinator. We have about 4,000 active patients. Not all of them rise to the level of needing com complex care coordination um, in our insurance mix, as you see there. In Vermont, we are um, uh, lucky to have uh, most uh, children have access to uh, health insurance at this point. Next slide, please. So I don't expect everyone to read this um, care coordination workflow, but just to show that it's a complex uh, process within a, a busy pediatric practice. And um, we ask each practice to um, look closely at how the system of care coordination can be implemented within the, the practice itself, which may be different. So you'll see here all the different components of care coordination. So part of that is the upper right, um, the actual patient visit. How does that visit actually get scheduled in your office if it is for a higher complex patient? Do you have reminders in your system to provide extra time um, that, that you may want to have your care coordinator spend uh, a few minutes with that family updating the shared plan of care uh, during that visit? Um, we have the map there is to remind us that in Vermont, we've also partnered with our Title V program, who has children with special health care needs, medical-based social workers that are regionally based. And part of our, our goals were to help connect medical homes, many rural primary care uh, medical homes, both family medicine and pediatric, to that wonderful, rich resource of Title V and the, 
the CSHN social worker. Not that that social worker would necessarily provide direct service to a patient family, although they may if they, um, if they needed to get involved, but to um, have questions asked of these people. They become a resource to us. How do we get that, that referral um, uh, to, ha to happen? How do we help with paying for this part of a, a wheelchair? Um, a family may need a, a home modified, and what kind of resources could there be in that ne neck of the woods to help modify um, their home? Ultimately, um, we have two main strategies for getting at this information. One is our, our upper left there is our nurse care coordinator, Christy, who um, builds relationship by relationship um, uh, community supports around um, uh, resources that are common themes for families and children and adolescents with different special health care needs, whether that be our uh, child protection service has become a, a key partner, um, and or our, our family to um, family voices organization, which in Vermont is called Vermont Family Network. Um, and the other tool that we use that we'll talk a little bit more about is a care conferencing model, um, which we hold within our office primarily, although um, occasionally our nurse practitioner or social worker um, from the community will attend on behalf of that family. Um, and can I have the next slide, please? As part of our learning collaborative um, we didn't ask and we don't ask uh, practices to sort of pick a population other than a population that is um, in need of chronic condition management or some sort of specified set of needs. So um, that entry into care coordination and primary care may happen as a physician walks into the room and sees that problem list and recognizes the high complexity and lack of organization and, and need for a shared plan of care. Um, another entry point is just previewing the schedule of uh, patients, um, looking at who's sort of organically coming into the office at the next time that um, you might consider um, uh, would benefit from shared care planning. Um, often a, a point of entry is as families are transitioning away from a hospital setting, so um, whether that's our, our NICU um, intensive care unit, um, families that may have some medical complexity transitioning to primary care follow-up or um, uh, an admission to the Children's Hospital for surgery. Um, we might have an entry point based on a, a family concern about a behavior problem at school. Um, or, um, or if we have a family that has been involved and has had home-based services who has not engaged or has been in contact for a while, that may be a place that we start as well. And then there's condition-specific um, types of, of care coordination efforts too, whether that's really planning around asthma or planning around behavioral health. Um, and, and we like to say that this care coordination is not for every child all the time, but it's for any child at some time. And as we all know in the life course, um, you know, about 20% of kids at some point will meet criteria for special health care needs, and some of those may need some care coordination. And when you have the right scaffold, when you have the right structure in place, um, it, it really can be adaptable to different populations. Uh, next slide, please. As we um, start with the Lucille Packard um, achieving a shared plan of care, you'll notice the top box is really having problem-solving conversations with family, having an, a depth of understanding of what, um, of what that particular family um, needs. We, we danced around the word assessment, and I think still in the adult world that word assessment comes to play, but our family health partners really resist that word. It's a very judgmental word. Another um, framework that has been used is root cause analysis, um, which again I think seems very unfamily centered, um, but I, I get it that you know maybe this patient's untreated or, or um, uh, diabetes is, is complicated by the fact that they don't have transportation or um, um, to, to that, that, um, that appointment that they haven't been able to keep, keep. So when we talk about assessment or identifying the needs of family, we always want to frame it and balance it by identifying the strengths. And, and we know um, from the Strengthening Families approach that there are certain factors that we can help um, families to um, um, kind of manage and become resilient if we provide information around child development and parenting skills to build parental resilience, um, understand that social connections are really important for families and, and, what, and I, helping them to identify what is there already. Um, at the same time, balancing that with 
identifying the needs. Uh, does your family have any developmental concerns about your child? Has there been a recent social change? And then in the middle is what does that family really want us to know about that child and that family? What does she, he or she do well, like, dislike? Um, and that all these pieces become part of that understanding of uh, the components that come together for building a shared plan of care. Next slide. This is um, an example of a tool that um, can be found through the National um, Center for Medical Home Implementation, um, also based on Jeannie's work. Um, really questions about medical and social and educational financial legal concerns that that family might have that they might not understand that you know we may not have the solutions to those, but helping to identify those as a source of stress, we may be able to connect them with someone who can help them and find the solution. Um, next slide. Because ultimately, um, the, the, we really want our patients to be in the community. And this is my slide for, for showing that families really do exist in the community. We want to also celebrate the high points um, of their lives, not, not just problem solving and sticky points, but have an opportunity to celebrate wellness as well with our families as we have this relationship over time. So some of the specific strategies, next slide, um, Anik um, really hit, hit home on. and, and um, and when the primary care setting as well. So before I even enter the room, um, pre-visit planning can happen, um, which includes things like chart review, but also um, uh, often our nurse care coordinator will share recent relevant information from a school setting, a social worker that may have seen that child at school. Um, we can perform screening tests ahead of time, so the PHQ-9 to help assess where depression scores are, an asthma control test. Um, hopefully there's even an agenda from the family for the visit today, and we ask our families to come to that visit, and we start always with the family's agenda. Um, come with the, uh, sort of a set of things that you want to make sure that we problem solve around. Um, labs, radiology, specialist visit reports, um, other community updates like for follow-up of ADHD, for example, we may have some Vanderbilts or um, child behavior checklists to review ahead of time. Um, all of this, the goal being then the time that you are in that room with that patient and family is that golden five, ten minutes of time that you could really be talking about things that are important, not just catching up on what we've missed out between the visit and last visit, but really putting your heads together to do what's best and what's needed for that family and child. Next slide. Um, this, um, this is another tool that has become part of our uh, medical home and care coordination <laughs> transformation in Vermont, not only for children but also for adults. I'm, I'm happy to say this tool that, that, that started in our social work colleagues' world um, is now really a part of, of our, our dialogue. And families often will come to people with this idea of a care map. So this is a template. There's a copy of it in the Lucille Packard guidelines as well, but the goal being is that you, it provides a template for understanding on one page who all is part of that care team, what, what financial supports exist, what community supports may or may not exist. So not only does it identify what exists, but also you can see where the gaps are when you have something to compare it to. Ultimately, having this also provides you with that valuable care team member, so you have a list of contacts for people. Um, next slide. This is a beautiful example of a real live um, uh, care plan that a family put together. And I don't expect anyone to be able to read it necessarily, but, um, but do you see, see the complexity that, of this particular family and the different places that she has from school versus specialists um, with their contact information? Um, and we actually we do bring this right into our electronic health record and to our electronic shared plan of care, which I'll talk about later. And we also identify on here the role of that team member, which I think, um, as Anique mentioned, is a very important piece because not every ENT specialist does and provides the same role for each family. Next, next slide. These next couple of the slides are really examples of other types of eco maps that, that exist. This one I love to highlight because it does have that squiggly line for to identify a relationship that's pretty stressful for the family, and the double lines there identify a, stress, a relationship that's very um, supportive and, and um, has been a positive one for families. Next slide. This example is done by another parent partner of ours, um, and you see how each of the family members identified. She color-coded this one based on how she sees the world sort of medically, things that are supportive, things that support her family, and things that are provided around education and community. Next slide. 
Um, so I was I happened to be part of our Vermont Medical Society meeting this past weekend, and I was um, really intrigued to find that um, the discussion was about preventing physician burnout and what a hot topic that is these days. Um, and when the speaker came to provide um, all the tools for how to prevent burnout, I was sort of expecting, oh, you know, something about yoga and how I need to take five minutes every day to, to, to breathe. Um, but what she really talked about was all about care coordination and the effective steps for um, providing um, care for, um, yeah, thanks, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the effective steps for um, uh, creating care coordination also um, help benefit us. So when I sit here and I say all this work that we have to do um, and why we should do this, it really does help improve our, um, our outcomes ourselves. So the, the signs of a highly efficient practice also benefit clinicians. Um, so although um, so we don't have to have all the solutions all the time, um, we feel better prepared, there's less time spinning our wheels, and more time for that brain work, that real thinking time about problem solving around a diagnosis or a situation or how, what language to use um, when talking about a topic with a family. Uh, next slide. And ultimately, the key to family engagement is building that trusting relationship that allows for timely, accurate information sharing. And um, next slide. Uh, and problem-solving discussions. Um, and sometimes the discussion doesn't, doesn't finish. So um, we have a, a parking lot uh, and follow-up, which is really key. So you might identify um, the need for, to help a youth with, um, uh, to be less fearful of medical procedures, for example, but not necessarily have that exact plan, but schedule time at another time to be able to um, talk more fully about that. And so next slide, one strategy for, um, providing a place for those problem-solving um, conversations is the CARE conference. And, and these have been called different things over, over the years, but ultimately um, it's a structured meeting. We do them in about an hour. Um, that includes the family, any family people that the support that they would like to bring to that meeting. Um, uh, sometimes the youth, if, the, if it's an adolescent where it's appropriate and they, they want to be part of the team meeting as well. Um, and we teach a structure of this. We always start with wellness. We talk about, we bring out the care map if there is one for that family um, so people kind of understand the resources in place. And, um, and there may be a need to share critical information like such as a new diagnosis or a new education evaluation. Um, we also um, come up with goals and next steps as part of our shared care planning process because ultimately the shared plan of care is shared in two ways, right? It's shared between uh, the family and the healthcare team that's making that care plan, but also it's something concrete that can be shared with the community. And I think sometimes we lean one way or the other on the, the sharing on that. Um, so some of those problem solving strategies, next slide, uh, that we teach and use is first off, um, I love this slide that talks about um, moving from unconsciously incompetent um, uh, with how you're doing things to unconsciously competent. Um, and we don't really know what we don't know. Um, so starting with understanding what our own inherent biases are, our beliefs, sometimes something as simple as a belief that seizures are bad or that, um, um, you know, uh, we'll go to the next slide. And um, and we talk about, uh, teach a little bit about conflict resolution uh, because often families are coming to the table um, and relationships can sometimes be strained um, in the medical home and, and having these trusting relationships um, enables us to help process that because I think the key is here that conflict is a situation in which the concerns of two or more people or parties appear to be incompatible. Um, and we have uh, been supportive in many many ways to help um, avoid some of that conflict um, by understanding what we bring to the table. And next slide. Um, this is a slide that really talks about conflict um, modes of thinking. And, and in the care conferencing and shared care planning world, we're really in that collaborating. So we both have to be assertive and understand what our needs are, but also be highly cooperative and understand that this is a mutual relationship. And you'll notice that if, if we had a compromising mode of communication around a family or patient's needs, you know, half, 50 percent of what um, we agree to, we don't, we don't get. Um, and uh, next slide. 
another important, very important, probably the most important piece of problem-solving discussions is understanding this, this sense of cultural humility. You know, at one point, I think in medical home lingo, we were talking about cultural effectiveness, um, and now it's really more about humility and, and maybe even responsiveness, um, which again takes um, the understanding first of our own knowledge, of our own beliefs, before we can understand another's. Um, and the next two slides, uh, next slide please. Um, we have about one minute. Okay, I'm, I'm good. We can, uh, uh, was just about different um, strategies around questions. My homage to the 80s. <laughs> so you can skip to the very last slide on, uh, with the V-chip at the top. Um, so because we have all these different electronic health records, we went ahead and um, uh, engaged in one little project to have an electronic shared plan of care, which we call the eSpoc, um, that families can have on their uh, mobile devices with them. And if you move ahead to the next slide, um, and then the final slide, this is a, a final slide that is the sort of a picture of what the shared plan of care can look like. So the family um, is involved with can update this. Um, we have access to it as well. It is not to supplant the electronic medical record, um, it, but it really is a space to measure and use for care coordination and communication. So anytime we don't have just a one-to-one -one communication, we can send out communications for a team um, with updates. Um, as well. And then this software can keep track of the, the time and types of care coordination that are being done to help with our research efforts. I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's so exciting to hear how much thought Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Hogan have put into this and, and with their team, I'm sure, as we're all struggling to know how to do this and then to give you 20 minutes to share it. Um, so thank you for how hard that task was. You're getting just a tremendous amount of wonderful questions, and I've been trying to categorize them. You've answered some of them as we've gone along, and we'll ask you to answer what, some of them more fully in written form later. But a lot of questions are about the actual shared plan of care, of course, such as who gets it and how do you interview or assess. Um, if you're an inpatient, does it start over? What goes to primary care? The one that I want to call out, um, well, actually two things. There was a call out about the social determinants of health and how that is, in, is considered in this. And then the other um, is using this shared planning process for addressing needs around transition to adult care. And I thought maybe both of you could touch on that, and then we'll move on to the, a couple of other questions. Sure. Um, this is Jill. I think absolutely the, the social determinants of, of health are part of that comprehensive understanding of, uh, of the family. And uh, whenever we ask those questions, we want to make sure that we can provide them with, um, uh, with with a resource. Um, and so we have sort of a stopping point with care coordination when families come in and we identify a, a high um, need for either an assessment or understanding of social determinants of health. So if it's housing issues or access to education or healthy nutrition or food in general, um, that might be for me bringing in a care coordinator who works with our community health team who's a social worker. We have like four hours of social work a week, which is fantastic. Um, and, and then the second part of that, talking about transition, uh, I am involved with a very small transition pilot with our adult medical homes to help transition one um, uh, a patient with one stable chronic condition, such as anxiety, depression, or um, asthma. Um, and we use the shared plan of care as our transition document. And we, um, everybody always wants to start their own version of what's in a, a, a shared plan of care and um, ultimately they come down to the same nuts and bolts as long as families are involved. Um, but that's, those are the two ways we're using those, both of those topics in, in Vermont here. How about you, Anique? Are you using the care planning process to address uh, needs around the healthcare transition? So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I mean, beginning with the, the question about the social determinants and how we consider those. So that is part of our routine intake for all new patients to our program, um, that we have a standardized process for our social worker to meet with them and just to um, review and, um, in, a, in a 
uh, fairly standard way um, any concerns um, or challenges that may be there so we can plug them in with the right resources, whether that be transportation, navigating community, community um, services, working with the school, working with um, uh, disabilities office, you know, with working with insurance challenges um, and whatnot, and, and in addition to issues around housing and security and uh, food insecurity and so on and so forth. So we find working with our social worker and having a social worker on the team is essential to that. Um, and that plays into, uh, plays into the care plan, um, certainly. And then, as far as the as far as the transitions, um, most of our patients within um, the Compass Care program are younger patients, and um, we actually um, that was fairly intentionally designed because we have um, we have a program here at CHOP um, that um, is run by one of my colleagues in MedPeds um, that has a particular interest in um, helping to transition these medically complex patients um, to adult health care, which as you know is a, a real significant challenge when you want to transition from multiple specialists in pediatrics to multiple specialists in the adult in the adult world. Right. Thank you. Um, another area of question was around, this is actually the million dollar question, I think. Um, one of mine as well. And I'll start with Anique and then go to Jill. And it's related to how do you work with a patient-centered, family-centered medical home um, when you are in a children's hospital specialty paradigm. And then um, we'll look to Jill in primary care and what fosters that communication and collaboration uh, with and in partnership with the family back and forth. So um, as, as I mentioned, we are we are a consulting um, program. So we work directly in partnership with, uh, with the primary care medical home. So not all of our patients are in practices that are designated as um, as medical home practices, although some of them certainly are. And so part of our process is to work with the primary care provider to introduce our program to them to let them know that what we are looking to do is to uh, partner with them in the care of this um, of this patient. We ask um, our primary care partners um, how they would prefer to have communication happen when their patients are in the hospital, when their patients come to see us um, um, in the office. And then we talk, we talk with the patients and families about how how they interact with their primary care provider, making sure that um, they're utilizing that that office to its fullest capability, specifically when it comes to um, uh, to, to sick visits as well as scheduled um, visits beyond the well child beyond the well child schedule, to be able to build and cultivate um, that relationship. And we make our program um, and our our care coordination resources specifically with our, with our care coordinator, our social worker, um, you know, our office coordinator, available to, as, to the practices as a resource to the primary care practice as well as the family. Thank you. Jill? Yeah, I think one great example, and, and our model here with Vermont Children's Hospital is also one that's mostly consultation. Um, but uh, when, when I have uh, patients of my own that are admitted to the hospital, if they aren't on my service, if they happen to be on a, a subspecialty service, um, we have had, a, a, when we're preparing for discharge for that families, they've actually been able to do a medical home consult with the primary care physician then come in and then we can actually work as a team both as a, a, a model of referral but also um, you know, showing how everybody can come to the team together. Um, and it is one of partnership. When we introduce these new technologies like this shared plan of care, um, go, um, we've gone directly to a children's hospital here and talked with each of the subspecialists about how we're trying to improve care coordination um, and asking them to have a point person within their center as well as within the medical home so that communication can be more, um, more seamless. Mm. Great. You got some shout outs for emphasizing um, children's strengths and abilities, um, while also some questions about uh, what their goals might be and what they might want to be doing in the community, whether it's recreation or um, you know other programs. And um, a few questions about how you address that as well as provide, um, access to your care neighborhood or medical home neighborhood or whatever we're referring to the community as in terms of uh, similar sort of collaboration and communication. Could you both just touch on that real quickly? Sure. Um, this is Jill. I think um, addressing uh, goals of the youth, I think 
um, as we introduce the concept of care coordination to a family, and often that's Christy, my care coordinator, but sometimes it's me, I think uh, any face-to-face -face time that we have, we, we sort of have the expectation that that youth and that family will come to our, our care coordination um, meetings and our meetings with uh, with your questions, with asking for those things so that we can provide um, some level of, of support. Um, if I don't necessarily have the answer to recreational opportunities for that part of Vermont, for example, I can offer up our uh, Vermont Family Network as a resource, or Christy may have a resource. Um, we do, in our practice, um, invite about once a month um, community resources to come to our practice to talk about what they do just so that we understand what, what kinds of opportunities that, that exist in, in our community and how best we can connect populations to, to gain from those um, services. Great. Anik, about five seconds maybe. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's, that's okay. I mean, I think, as I mentioned, um, you know, addressing these goals is pretty principal in the development of the plan and really making our prioritization um, very family focused. Um, we try to utilize these goals that the patients have to bring them to the rest of the care team because it really helps with decision making around what things we're going to do, what things we're not going to do, and when we're going to do them. Uh, that's a nice way to end. I want to thank you both for your time and the investment you put in this and the practical tips and for the future questions that we will ask you to answer. Um, we have a lot of questions that we did not have time to address. We'll ask Jill and Anik to help with some answers to those and those will be made available. The slides and recording will also be available on the Lucille Packard website and we thank them for focusing on this topic that we are all so very passionate about. Um, thank you all for joining. And until uh, next time, it's Jeannie McAllister. Bye-bye.